Welcome to the Gamification Report, episode 10. This is a special issue. We're going to be looking at neuroscience today. We're going to start with some really interesting papers looking at cognitive emotional perspectives in serious games. Um, some material that's some of its pre-publication manuscripts we've been able to obtain. We're going to look at this area of neurotourism. Remember we spoke in our last episode about virtual diving. Uh, talk about neurotourism and how it's picking up. We're going to be looking at brain monitoring and neuroscience, neuroscience gamification, and mirror neurons in serious simulation games. These are some really fascinating areas which all converge on this area, area of higher learning using gamification and the neuroscience of digital neuropsychology. We're going to start with a paper by Jeffrey K. Mullins and Rajiv Sabarwal, the University of Arkansas, 2018. And what they looked at here was the connection of emotion to serious educational games, what they call a cognitive emotional perspective. And this is based on the fact that there are three dominant emotional theories, what's called the differential emotions theory, the cognitive emotion theory, and appraisal theory. Let's uh, dig a little bit deeper. Theories of emotion, and, and we know this is an area that's just exploding. For example, cannabis is becoming legalized over the next couple of months here in Canada. And um, cannabis um, uh, operates by stimulating the uh, anandamide receptors in the cortex and uh, different areas of the brain. There's actually many locations for these receptors. And we don't have these cannabinoid receptors uh, for getting high on weed. That's not the reason nature designed them. That's a side effect of the drug use. What the anandamide receptor seems to do is it links emotion to learning. And this is why in many different studies, uh, every study that we looked at in our reviews showed that cannabis interfered with learning in, 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 in rats and in, and, and all kinds of test animals uh, because those receptors actually connect emotion to learning. So emotion and learning are, are, are something that we're beginning to understand much more on a molecular level now. So let's just start with a bit of a shallow dive to look at basic theories of emotion and understand how gamification can fit into um, emotional based learning in a more um, nuanced way than we might have talked about a few years ago. Uh, the first theory of emotion is called differential emotion, and that is what we have what are called non-cognitive emotions which are innate and develop early, and that we develop co social cognitive emotions later in life. Um, so non-cognitive emotions are various things like, hey, you took my toy, or geez, I'm hungry, <laughs> or I miss you, mommy. Um, social cognitive emotions might have to do with how you interact with other people and might have to do with developing more social cognitive, uh, complex social structures. The cognitive emotional theory uh, of emotion is that all emotions result from cognitive appraisal, whether it's automatic or volitional. So all of our emotions have to do with some kind of cognitive that is thinking or intellectual task, and the emotion arises in response to the task. So being chased by the saber-toothed tiger is something that threatens your survival, so the emotion arises out of the cognitive content. And then the appraisal theory of emotion is that emotions result from the unconscious strategies we develop for coping, so that emotions actually arise from the unconscious and that they all have to do with um, basic biological coping mechanisms. So again, we're not going to get too much into the psychology, but it gives us a bit of um, a, a ground uh, work uh, to explore the topic a bit further. So let's talk a little bit about uh, time bending. Um, the amygdala is a part of the brain which is a critical hub which regulates flow and integration between the brain regions and cognitive emotional interactions. Um, so emotion involves connecting different parts of the brain which might have to do with visual perception or somatosensory perception and thought and experience. So we know in amygdala, we've known this for a long time, that things like fear processing and focusing attention on potential threats occurs in the amygdala. Uh, so encoding consol consol consolidation and subjective recollection of memories are all linked to emotional stimulus. Uh, so emotions are very, very strongly linked to learning in terms of the uh, areas such as the ventral striatum. The ventral striatum is the emotional reward learning center of the brain. So when we learn to, to appreciate a certain wine or we like a certain type of music or we, we, we want to connect some kind of more physical, more professional skill um, to, to learning, this is all uh, has to do with, with, with attaching reward to learning. So 
the perspective they're using as they look at this paper is that serious um, educational games can activate the amygdala more effectively than other experiences in learning. And that's the core that I think we're all arriving toward. You know, we're all marching in this field of gamification, gamification towards some kind of distant goalpost. And where it appears that we're moving now is trying to understand how the amygdala becomes engaged, how games actually connect emotional learning. Um, in ways that um, factual learning doesn't really occur in kind of ways that we might have spoken in the past. Um, so there's the amygdala we can see in this little rotating image. The amygdala right here, it looks like an almond. And uh, this is the hippocampus, this blue area, which is our um, kind of consolidation and memory area of the brain. Um, and so all, all of these networks are, are quite complex, but we're again looking at the primary uh, drive. So what they conclude in, in, in spilling out a very, very uh, well-reasoned hypothesis is by integrating a map of the structure of motions within game mechanics, we can elicit various emotions and therefore de designers can draw on this perspective to develop gamified design. So we can talk about gamified design of learning through manipulating emotional circuitry. And I think this cognitive emotional uh, bit of the iceberg is something that's really going to help us move forward in the field because I don't, quite frankly, I don't think this level of psychological analysis has been applied to serious educational games in the past. Um, and I now that we see a more microscopic kind of dissection of the, uh, s the breakdown of, a, of different types of emotion that occur during learning and being able to use a game element to pull out uh, fear or competitiveness or reassurance or, um, or uh, perhaps storification, some of these elements. So we want to keep our, our eyes in this ball and it gives us something very uh, real to work on. So when we want uh, to teach at a higher level and more effective level, we have these complex emotional experience and we want to persuade learners, we want to use this process of persuasion through what we would call engineered experience. So they would then conclude in this paper that there was a call for serious experience and serious games. Um, and the idea that persuasive health messages, uh, for example, when we talk about smoking cessation ca campaigns or drug avoidance campaigns, etc., all use pers persuasive messaging. But we're looking at it in a more nuanced way that there are ways through se using serious educational games to trigger specific sets of emotional responses that are more effective for transference of learning and locking in learning. It's just fascinating stuff that's developing. Now, I think you all remember this great little footage uh, from uh, National Lampoon's Family Vacation and the idea that we are moving toward neurotourism. And I think this is an interesting segue uh, that was explored by Amis Panyak and Jose Concalves in 2018. And again, this takes the idea of emotionality and, and brings it to something that we can all relate to a bit, which is neurotourism. Tourist behaviors and emotions are very, very key. Uh, if you have a really great trip down to um, uh, a wonderful place like you visit uh, Cuernavaca or you, you go down to Africa and you explore Zambezi, um, you, you can understand that that creates an emotional impact. And so what, under, what underlies tourism, as in many activities, is develop, delivering an emotional sense of satisfaction. So. Uh, as we talked about in our last uh, podcast, um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality then can deliver tourist experience. So where you are actually going to be becomes secondary to the actual tourism experience. And I know this is probably not the best example, but think about how, you go how good you feel after visiting a friend who's got a great pool in their backyard and spending a day and then having a nice barbecue, even if it's a one hour drive to visit them. It's that we actually switch our neurological circuitry to get the emotional experience equated with what we call vacation or tourism and then we can actually recreate those experiences by sim simulane which is why a lot of people might have swimming pools and so, for example, uh, Elon Musk produced something called Neuralink, and that's an imp implantable brain-computer interface, which is uh, will eventually produce a non-invasive brain-to-brain communication. And you can look at his work. I mean, it's received quite a bit of, I mean, even a Wikipedia um, kind of uh, entry on it would, would, would take you fairly deep into this idea of using Neuralink. Um, and then... 
This this uh, word, uh, this concept is explored by some other authors. We found the work of Diego Semperboni and Luca Vigano at King's College, 2018, in which they look at the what they call mind mining. And so this is the idea, again, of taking these ideas we talked about in neurotourism, but taking these in, in terms of persuasive interaction with the website. So anger, frustration, and curiosity drive websites designed for maximum customer visits. And we know that the reward systems that you build when you build a, re a website have to do with health or wealth related. So one fantasy was Black Mirror's Nosedive. Black Mirror was a British uh, series shown on Netflix in which uh, we, we can actually uh, start to report on each other's behavior. And um, we, we actually enter a very uh, kind of dark space right now called crypto jacking. And this is where we actually take over your brain by using um, uh, neuro, digital neuropsychology to uh, take a certain percentage of brain cognitive time and attention and behaviors related to core messages. So when you go to any specific website, as our uh, colleague uh, Brian Kugelman who works with AlterSpark, which is a leader in the area of digital neuropsychology, there are digital neuropsychologists being hired by uh, very large companies now. And this is the idea of crypto jacking. So essentially you get apps on your phone that then drive you to specific behaviors. And they're essentially moving you in, in, into purchase decisions and to, to nail your cognitive attention and behaviors. And I said that this is reflected in some very dystopic kind of visions. And this is what we call this idea of mind mining, of trying to take any bit of cognitive space that we have left over beyond all the things we have to do in our life, taking that cognitive space and, and having us focus on doing something very small related to a purchase behavior. It's um, really insidious kind of stuff, um, but we need to understand that that's kind of at the forefront. Um, there are, of course, uh, some other developments in this area, idea of uh, this active neuroscience called brain monitoring devices. Bill Byram et al. publishes in 2018 um, this idea of wellness development, which is going to be a $612 billion industry by 2024. In 2015, wellness development is a $123.2 billion industry. And these are essentially wearable devices that measure your brain activity, which are round around the forehead. And the signals are collected as you think and process by a series of dry electrodes which are then filtered and interpreted by firmware to provide a continuous EEG signal trace. So you're able to do uh, things like access your own brain waves and use that feedback to achieve different states of consciousness. Um, and, 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 and and to, to give us maybe a little more to bite into, examples that are already on the market and being developed would include Muse, which is being developed in, in Terexon uh, in Toronto, Canada, Emotive Epic uh, in, in Sydney, Australia, and Zenzone, developed by Neurosky in San Jose, California. The Muse device uh, consists of a uh, head, uh, headband that you wear across your forehead with seven sensors positioned across the forehead and it's behind each ear. So this essentially you put on this Muse device, so that's collecting electrophysiological data. And by using an element of game-like elements in terms of setting targets, uh, you could use it for, for example, pain control, or you could use it for wakefulness, you could use it um, for hunger control and, and different appetite and drive control. This whole idea of, um, of these early Neuralink ideas, uh, but being um, used for the individual's wellness development. Um, EEG devices and pain are being used uh, more and more. Pain QX, uh, coming out of New York, uh, New York, uses research grade and portable EEG electroencephalograms again to assess neural brain activity, and it uses algorithms to describe pain states. And I, I worked in pain research for a number of years. And uh, one problem we've always had is how to know the kind of pain that a patient is in because uh, eventually we use a, um, a visual analog scale. So you might have a sheet of paper and the person has to point on the sheet of paper, how bad is the pain today? Is it a 50, is it a 70, is it a 100? So what they're doing with EEG, e e the pain QX for example, is they're able to assess these and produce an algorithm to give you a different kind of display. Um, so there are many different uh, types uh, of these uh, that, that, uh, that are coming along in the pain management and wellness area. Um, the New York University Brain Research Laboratory Normative Database has an, uh, uh, it provides an exclusive license uh, for pain QX. And uh, essentially this laboratory database was based on 20,000 patient database over, 30, uh, over the past 30 years. So it's culture, ethnic, and gender free, but not age free. And then they fuse that with looking at what's called electroencephalogram localization 
which allowed it to decode neural activity to localize activated brain regions. So you ended up with a three-dimensional representation of regions of the brain that seem to be active when you're experiencing pain. And then they did what was called the third step of this uh, technology was pain matrix correlation, which allowed it to filter out areas not correlated to the perception of pain. So essentially you end up with some kind of uh, high-low pain state. So in the upper figures you see above have to do with patients that are in quite a bit of pain, and you can see that it shows on the sensors these activations of parts of the brain, and in the bottom you don't see as much activity that would be a pain-free subject. So you're not <coughs> measuring from the thalamus, you're not measuring from the actual pain receptor regions of the brain. You're trying to find correlates of uh, brain activity which seem uh, to connect to pain experiences. Um, there's trauma in footballers. This was another interesting study developed by Sarara in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And that is objective measures of disease stage and outcome. And this occurs in people that play uh, football and hockey and other contact sports. So you have mild brain contusions if you're hit, let's say, during a hockey game and smashed into the boards. Or you might have really serious problems that you might see in rugby and soccer and football with less protection. So the diagnosis and management of contusion is performed using subjective tools and self-reports similar to the pain model, but companies such as Sorora have developed biosensors which uh, use, again, these kind of devices you place on the forehead. When you combine them together with traditional cognitive tests, empowered clinicians to look at the degree of brain injury. So all of this neuroscience that's developing using this, this, these kind of tools is, uh, again, contributing to this wellness and the self-monitoring in areas that were very, very difficult. And it's important for us to look at early stage development of these lesions and to be able to look at the actual actual uh, critical hits and what contribution they have to player performance down the road and to long-term uh, recovery prospects. Um, there are again uh, also other systems. Uh, the Moticon system is an insole system that's been designed in which you can look at timing, balance, pressure, force, and motion by having a biosensor that's uh, located in a foot pad. And that allows you feedback um, that you could imagine would be useful in many different ways, everything from rehabilitation to improving uh, sports activity performance. There's also a good deal of eye tracking technology that's developing to look at what you look at when you engage a computer or a website. And by using eye, track, eye tracking, then you're able to correlate that with different behavioral activities. The Sensomatic and Toby eye tracking technology leaders, uh, SMI in Telto, Germany, is now owned by Apple. And Toby, which is uh, based in Stockholm, Sweden, are the leaders in the space, which are lab-based camera systems. So again, we're not only getting feedback from looking at the activities of the brain, but we're allowing this neurophysiological feedback to arrive um, using sensors located in different areas of the body. Um, gaze capture um, by Apple is something that some of you might have heard that's coming on board. Researchers at the MIT and the University of Georgia and the Max Planck Institute have produced gaze capture, and it works on your Apple mobile device, and it essentially displays a sequence of dots that you're able to track and fixate. So you have front-facing cameras which capture eye moving during performing tasks, and then that's put a machine uh, learning algorithm and then you can predict gaze with low errors in smartphone and tablet devices. So you can end up to the point where you can operate uh, machinery and devices by simply moving your eyes in very, very um, um, subtle ways. Uh, and you're going to see a lot more of this technology. And so here we have the basic breakdown of gaze capture by MIT, showing, uh, showing the gaze capture on different images of faces and how you can actually, uh, how we scan the face, how it tracks the image, and how that can be used then to activate different um, kinds of, of uh, applications and technologies that are wearable. Um, we're now going to take a bit of a switch from a lot of this work in biosensors and advanced tracking technologies and look at neuroscience gamification. We're going to look at the work now of Alexandra Pregolowski in uh, 2015 in neuroscience. Now, as early as 1961, Irving Goffman had argued, along with other sociologists, that play was a form of serious social interaction that required nuanced definition. So play has... Um, we can really say that gamification is a reboot of Irving Goffman's work. So essentially, we would argue from an anthropological standpoint uh, that gamification is a way of um, modernizing our view of play and that play is actually how we develop interactions with other people in the world. So essentially, everything we do is a form of play. Now, Scott Nicholson at University of uh, uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier uh, talks about play as being exploration within boundaries. 
He's a board game design a professor. I think he teaches gamification, a well-known name in the industry. So we, we've had a chat several years ago about defining play. But this is taking play and looking at it in a much more anthropological standpoint, that it is actually the primary way in which we interact with other people. Um, the Mellon headset is a headband and mobile app duo that is a, a, a self-tracking device. And what it essentially does is it allows us to play and interact um, with, with data and with different situations or simulations and then to measure brain activity. So the Mellon device will develop algorithms that allow us to detect what the user is focusing on and then provide personalized feedback on how to pursue, uh, improve. So essentially you're using a device which is based on the idea of you being in a playful exploratory interaction with the environment and giving you feedback on how to interact with the environment more effectively. So, for example, Melon was a great little device in which you were able to create origami creatures using focus. So you can see on the screen, if you focus your attention, you can fold your bird. And if you focus your attention really well, then you can fold a little bear, you can have a little birds. So what it's doing is actually measuring a specific state of consciousness. There's um, uh, other games that have been used for bi uh, biofeedback uh, that, that have been around for a number of years, but this is one that really looks at, at focus and our ability to, um, to do things in a virtual space, like virtual origami, by giving us personalized feedback on how focused we are at the task. And this is really a kind of idea of positive neuropsychology, which um, is called the positivity ratio. And let's talk about this for a moment as we begin to wind down here. The Losada ratio, or the Losada line, derived from the work of Losada in 2015, is, is largely discredited now in positive psychology. And that is that we have what are called flourishing people and languishing people. So flourishing is this idea that we want to be at a Losada level of 2.9 or above. Um, so again, we flourish when we're in a playful state. That's the basic idea. Um, uh, and, and, and this goes back to some, I mean, this, this goes back thousands of years. If we look at the work of Aristotle and Socrates, they wrote on something called eudaimonia. And eudaimonia is flourishing in life. Um, we have what's called hedonia, which is pleasure in life. And we have um, what's called eudaimonia, which is meaning in life. And when we have a high pleasure of meaning and a high pleasure of purpose and satisfaction, then we are in a flourishing state. So think of gamification then way, as a way, a technique to boost productivity by moving us closer to flourishing states uh, through play. And I know we're taking you on quite a journey today, but um, we're, we're going to conclude by looking at kind of what's probably going on um, in how we interact with other people in play states and, and how this is going to um, imply uh, working in, in digital psychology and gamification moving forward. And gamified neuroscience uses this term of mirror neurons a lot. And I'm, I'm, some of you may be aware of mirror neurons, and we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into this. Um, basically, when we see somebody do something else, we mirror them. And the mirror neurons are doing that. So if I'm around somebody who's expert and I do what they do, then I'm occurring it. And mirror neurons can be used for mirroring undesirable behaviors as well. So Yukti Pro uh, specializes in productivity enhancement. It tries to build using mirror neuron interactions uh, to uh, progress. So it's a way of actually digitizing how we watch others progress. So you have a new karate student entering the dojo for the first time, or an Aikido student, watching their master doing Aikido or Karate, and they begin to mirror those actions. And again, it's a form of playful interaction. Play not as in frivolous, but playful as in this exploratory space in which we learn. Um, and so mirror neurons are, uh, are, are specifically located in, in regions uh, of the brain um, in which we uh, uh, use simulation games. So think about it, if we built a game for simulating work uh, in any kind of industry, we would essentially be trying to trigger mirror neurons through the game system rather than having to rely on watching the person that would normally teach us. You would engage mirror neurons in, in the game. So you would observe an action which would trigger simulation of that action. Neurons in the premotor cortex would fire during these actions. And therefore, this empathy uh, called inner imitation would then kick in. So essentially, in the game system, you would be in a virtual world dealing with virtual problems, and each one of them triggering mirror neurons uh, in, in, in a storified context. Um, now, mirror neurons are uh, 
connect uh, a lot of different regions of the brain. And we're not going to go into this in too much detail, but we can see here that we have motor outputs, that what you do, your intention of reading, your goal sequencing and representation. And we develop a generative model based on uh, prediction error. So again, to make this simple, if I were spending my first day on the job learning a skill like handling a customer return, and I watch the more experienced uh, person teach me how to manage a complex return, they lost a receipt or something like this, I might um, do the wrong things and that would um, give the, the wrong output, the customer's unhappy or you know things wouldn't um, resolve properly in the system. So we develop a generative model by mirroring different activities. And the big question here is how we actually trigger uh, mirror neuron, the idea that we would have some kind of um, uh, cognitive apprenticeship that would develop. So. This goes back to the work of uh, uh, Raj Mohan and Mohandas, 2007. And it was funny, they discovered mirror neurons serendipitously uh, by Rizalati and his work when they were looking at the grass response of macaque monkeys. And there was an area in the premotor cortex called area F5. So whenever one animal was doing something and the other monkey see, monkey do, these neurons would fire all the time. So it turns out that there's all kinds of diverse m m populations of mirror neurons complain, uh, uh, contained in the brain, mostly in the premotor cortex. Now, the premotor cortex is a fascinating area of the brain. I remember the premotor cortex tells you to move before you actually move. So if you say, I want to walk across the room, the premotor cortex would prime the brain for that activity. And there's a lot of questions about what fires the premotor cortex, which is the seat of human will. It goes right back to Descartes' original questions um, going to the 17th century um, of what is the will. And I remember our meetings with Nobel laureate um, Sir John Eccles, who later on his life uh, started to uh, look at what the human soul could be in, in terms of human interaction. When we have a desire to undertake any action, it occurs in this premotor cortex. Of course, Eccles was being somewhat fanciful. He was talking about probability of waves occurring in the cortex, which had to do with quantum release of neurotransmitters. But what's interesting is that mirror neurons seem to drive the very basis of our behavior, and that is fascinating but insidious. It means if you were raised in a family with highly dysfunctional behaviors, then you would mirror those behaviors. And it's not that you're consciously learning them, you're actually triggering these neurons by seeing how your parents or other family members engage. So the mirror neurons are located in, in many different parts of the brain. And we'll just step back um, one slide here. And it's our second last slide. Um, and, and this is again looking at the superior temporal sulcus. And this is the mirror neuron system that we see. This is the primary motor cortex. This is where we decide to move. And so the premotor cortex is right in here. So the mirror neurons are in a specific area of the brain that's um, picking up activities that we see in either simulation or in real people moving around us. And this picks us up uh, to. I would say a good point to conclude today would be how does this connect with empathy? Because empathy is an interesting subject in itself. Um, empathy is how we would then take social cognition and add it to the mirror neuronal understanding. So how we actually deal with others and understand people has to do with our ability to understanding their emotional processing. And empathy is not always a good thing. Um, in, in fact, it's been argued by some scholars that empathy was the basis of the Third Reich, that the German people arose up with kind of an anger at how they'd been treated in the First World War, and that Hitler, uh, a, a part of his peel, and all populist totalitarian leaders have, have de have depended upon empathy, us trying to empathize with this great cause to move forward with, that we must fight the great battle, in that case for emerging Nazi Germany. Um, and so empathy is not the benign activity that we might say that we, we like empathy. Um, empathy is a way of actually seeing the world or experiencing the world through these motor neuron networks. So by understanding motor neuron, uh, uh, you know, uh, mirror neuron networks, under we can probably understand ways that we inherit hatred and understand populism and understand isolation from others as well. So we're, we, we've gone around the, the bend today and taken you very deep into understanding how serious games can affect us on such deep levels of emotion and cognition. I hope today has been helpful for you. It's certainly been a deep dive for us. We'll see you next week. David Chandras from the Center for Teaching and Learning at Humber College. Have a great week.